so in light of the Daniel Bellinger Memorial Award, so research that we were able to uh, complete with that was the diffusion uh, imaging study on the differences between people with hearing loss and tinnitus and with hearing loss but without tinnitus. And so what you do with diffusion imaging is that you look at the white matter tracks. And so the brain is uh, consists of, of either fluid, so cerebrospinal fluid. It consists of gray matter, which is what we usually hear of, which are the neurons, which do the actual computations, calculations, which become active uh, in response to sound. And then there's the white matter. And the white matter tracks consist of the axons and they sort of connect um, very distal and very near gray matter neurons. And so they facilitate the processing of sound in our um, research where we're focused on the sound part of this. And so this white matter is myelinated. That myelin is this sort of fatty substance. It's a lipid and it coats the axons and this facilitates fast information transfer, which is very necessary for an auditory system to function well. And so what we investigate is, is are there differences that relate to hearing loss and are there differences that specifically re relate to tinnitus in addition to having hearing loss? And we actually found significant differences in the acoustic um, tracks in people with tinnitus. And then specifically, we focused on the acoustic radiation, which is the largest white matter tract in our auditory system. It connects to something called the medial geniculate, which is the phalemic nucleus. And this phalemic nucleus is the last station before sound reaches the auditory cortex, where it's generally believed that perception of sound sort of is created. So where we become aware of the sound. And we found differences in this acoustic radiation. And we found differences in the fiber um, cross-section of this um, tract. And what that means is that the tract was smaller, sort of on average, it's more compressed, more condensed. There was no axonal loss per se. Um, and so we interpret this as reflecting that there is a difference in the myelination. And what this means is that, so there is less myelin, and myelination is dependent on activation. So this may reflect that there are differences at the peripheral level and the peripheral level reflects the ear, um, that there's differences in hearing levels, which result in less stimulation higher up in the auditory system. So in the brain, which result in less myelination. And something that may be very interesting in future research to look at is whether this is indeed reflective of very small differences in peripheral hearing thresholds or whether this reflects sort of a a sort of pre-existing vulnerability for tinnitus. So we know that our methods that we have used, so pure tone audiograms, are not very sensitive to small differences in hearing thresholds. So we can't really exclude that these differences are due to differences in hearing thresholds um, with the methods that we have used here, but there are methods to more, uh, more carefully examine this, and I think it's important to use those in future studies. And then this may still relate to tinnitus in the sense that those with those sort of different thresholds um, or those differences in peripheral differentiation are more vulnerable to tinnitus. And this may be pre-existing that people who respond differently to hearing loss um, are more likely to later on uh, develop tinnitus, or it may be sort of a reflection of the overall capacity of the brain to reorganize or to sort of adapt to things like sensory hearing loss. So currently I've taken a bit of a different direction in my research. So what I've realized is in tinnitus research, we are very focused on sort of theories that, that are around the sort of subcortical nuclei. So sort of the lower end um, of the hierarchical uh, auditory system. So when sound enters the ear, it first goes to the cochlear nucleus and then it goes up through the brainstem midbrain to the auditory cortex. And we actually don't have... Uh, good methods at present available to sort of investigate these very, very tiny brainstem areas that we suspect are related to tinnitus in humans. And so I've changed fields a bit to both acquire sort of expertise with these methods to image um, these teeny tiny nuclei, but also to look further into the relation between hearing loss, tinnitus and hyperacusis and aging, because we know that we often see we see tinnitus and hyperacusis in people with hearing loss and hearing loss is often seen in the older sort of population. And these people are not only um, sort of affected by hearing loss, but what we also know is that uh, there are other factors that can play a role in, in sort of the aging brain. So I've now switched to the Alzheimer's field actually to investigate pathology in the brain and to take all of these methods and to take all of this knowledge into account when we study, especially the older population with tinnitus and hyperacusis and hearing loss.
So in the Alzheimer study that are running in the lab that I'm working now, that's the lab of Dr. Heidi Jacobs, we are also acquiring information on hearing levels uh, and doing audiograms. And so I hope that I will generate enough preliminary data to write a grant that incorporates all of these aspects of people who have hearing loss and tinnitus. Mm -hmm.